Reteach, podcast for teachers seeking fresh viewpoints, deeper subject knowledge and diverse thinking. Hello everybody and welcome to this edition of the Reteach podcast. My name is Carmel Bones and I'm interested in all things education. I'm absolutely thrilled today to have Dr. Paula Bartley with me, a feminist historian who has written widely and promoted women's history. Her books include Ellen Wilkinson, who I have to confess to looking up, a British Labour politician and Minister of Education who had a prominent role in the Jarrow Crusade. She's also written on Queen Victoria and Labour Women in Power, Cabinet Ministers in the 20th Century. She's a former judge and chair of the Women's History Network Prize. And I'm delighted to say that as of this week, hot off the press, she's an honorary research fellow at the University of Warwick. So welcome, Paula. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Carmel. And I'm looking forward to our conversation about my new book on women's activism. Well, I first came across Paula when I was teaching A-level history quite a few years ago now and the Access to History series. And one of my wonderful students, shout out to Declan Connolly, he came out of the exam and said, thank goodness for the Bartley book, miss. And I thought, yes, we've cracked it. And he went on to great things. And so I'm really thrilled to be with Paula today. Paula is no stranger to the Reteach podcast. She's contributed to five lists Um, Beyond what we've already mentioned, she's written about female spies and secret agents in World War II, the SOE, and women's activism in the 19th and 20th centuries in Britain. And it's 20th century female activism, which we're going to talk about today. So what motivated you to write your book, Paula? Well, to be honest, I didn't start out writing a book on women's activism. I started researching a book on women in the 20th century. Now, after about six months, I realized it was going to be far, far too big. So I took the advice that I used to give to my students and I started narrowing my research project to something more manageable. And it gradually dawned on me that there was no overview of women's activism. There are books about suffrage, about trade union rights, about abortion campaigns, about peace campaigns and so on, I thought it would be a good idea to pull together all the amazingly different types of activism. And what I found when I was reading and researching was that the diversity of women's activism was breathtaking. Women were involved in a wide range of political activities. And my book, I think, is a story of women from different classes, from different racial and ethnic groups, from different political persuasions. And I think what I'm trying to show is that women were not, and never have been, a homogenous group. That we, what divides us is almost as much as what unites us. That really strongly comes through. It's such a complex story, multi-layered, I would entirely agree. And in terms of school history, it mainly seems to be about the suffragettes. Um, marching, fasting, women chaining themselves to railings, unless students or teachers have perhaps read um, Death in 10 Minutes by Fern Riddell and learned about Kitty Marion, they may well not have gone beyond the sort of famous textbook characters. So what other issues beyond voting did you explore women were taking action for or against? Well, What struck me, as I said before, was the variety. And actually what I was interested in was also local uh, activism too, because so many of the women activists in my book were very ordinary. They weren't rich, they weren't famous, they weren't influential, and yet they affected quite a lot of change. For instance, working class women like Lillian Beloka Now, Lillian Beloka persuaded the government to change the law. Now, just imagine this. It's 1968. And in the first few months of that year, three hull trawlers keeled over in the fierce Atlantic Sea close to Iceland. Hurricane force winds, giant waves, sub-zero temperatures, all led to the ships icing up 
and then sinking in those freezing waters. 58 men died. And trawler fishing in the 1960s was the most dangerous occupation in Britain, five times more dangerous than even coal mining. Now, these devastating losses of their menfolk prompted women from the fishing industry to take action. Lillian Beloka is the name. She was the 17 stone daughter, wife, and mother of trawler men. And she led hundreds of angry, grief stricken women to confront the owners of the trawlers and to demand safer ships. No owner would talk to them. So Big Lil, as she was known, and the other trawler wives travelled down to London to see the Home Secretary and asked him to reform the industry. He was convinced by their suggestions. These were working class women who weren't particularly articulate, but they put forward 88 safety measures and all of these measures were taken on board by the government and passed into law. So trawler fishing became safer, all because of one woman. That's incredible. I grew up in Whitehaven in the 1980s, so knew about the miners' strike through, you know, the effect of the policies of Margaret Thatcher and food banks and all the things we talk about today were happening then. So it sounds as though women have played a pivotal role locally, nationally, linked to these big, wider debates around um, industrial conditions, um, you know, the miners' strike, the whole trawlerman. It seems as if women are playing a part, and until now, perhaps their stories haven't been told. And your book will be a type of educational activism, yeah. putting them front and centre, and rightly so. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, yes, I think women in the miners' strike in the 70s are probably well known. But, you know, there's a little known group that supported the miners and campaigned for them. Um, and it was from um, the northeast of England. And I think they're one of my favourite groups and they're called the Dolly Mixtures. And the, there were a group of working class women who formed a group and sang and danced and told jokes in the northeast working men's clubs. They wanted to raise money initially for a hospital darts board, which they got, then for cancer research, which they did, and then they started dancing and singing in support of striking miners. Now, these women entered a man's world. Apart from strippers, women were not allowed into male clubs. And these eight women, they dressed in chicken costumes, they sometimes dressed in gingham dresses, sometimes in Carmen Miranda outfits with fruit all over their heads. And for a saucy song about pheasant pluckers, now try saying that quickly or not, they wore smocks and put straw into their hair. Now, the group raised more than £100,000, which is a considerable amount of money in the 1970s. And halfway through their fundraising, the cancer research team wrote to them saying that the money raised by the Dolly Mixtures had helped make a breakthrough in the treatment for colon cancer. So they contributed to that, but they also, when the miners were on strike, realised that they needed funding and they performed uh, in support of that as well. So their lives have completely disappeared. And I only discovered them because I was up in the northeast speaking at a venue in South Shields. And at the same time, they were showing a film about the Dolly Mixtures, which was a musical written by Tom Kelly. You can get it on YouTube, but nobody I know, and I live in the south of England, knows about them. Why not? I'm, I'm delighted you're putting the Dolly Mixtures back on the stage, so to speak. And it sounds as if these local groups of activism have been very important. And Interestingly, in, in your book, um, Mary Jane Howe famously wrote in 1914, no two women can ever be friends. Women are cats. Now, that really struck me because nothing could be further from the truth. You mention women as not a homogenous group. They have differences. 
different starting points in terms of their rights and interests. But, you know, they've, they've made such a difference across the ages and uh, uh, across the country. Have you found any cases where women have pulled apart as well as pulling together? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as I said right at the beginning, women are often from various political persuasions. And one tends to think that women's activism's women's activism attracts women who are progressive and that we think of women activists who are always on the side of the underdog. It's not the case. Not all women activists held progressive views and were fighting against those who held them. For instance, the first ever fascist organization, which was called the British Fascist, Fascisti, I actually say it, was actually set up in 1923 by a woman called Rotha Beryl Linton Ornman. Now, fortunately, fascism really didn't take off in, in, in Britain until really the 1930s when Oswald Mosley, as we know, founded his new party, which later became the British Union of Fascists. It was an anti-Semitic and xenophobic group. And they set up a woman's section headed by Mary Richardson. Now, you might have come across Mary Richardson because she was a famous suffragette who had slashed the Rokeby Venus. And she became the head of the women's section. And soon, as a result, I think, of her, fascists became something like 25% of the membership. And of course, the most notorious of all the fascist women were the aristocratic Mitford sisters, Diana and Unity Mitford. Diana left her first husband for Oswald Mosley, whom she secretly married at the home of Joseph Goebbels, with Hitler as guest of honour. Unity also joined the British Union of Fascists, and in 1939, she shot herself in the head when war was declared between Britain and her beloved Germany. Now, lots of women did not approve of the fascists. And there was one notorious case in 1934 at Olympia when there was a huge scuffle and women protesters were violently ejected uh, from this fascist meeting. And as a result of the publicity of that and the horror of Olympia, I think the fascist movement started to go into decline, thankfully, because a lot of the papers before that had been quite sympathetic to the fascists. And I think the Olympia rally, in which women objected to fascism and protested in the audience, it kind of helped lead to their decline. So if we think across the century, then, in terms of what was new and what grew, um, the fascism, the support for fascism came and went. What things continued and what issues changed across the 100-year period? Well, I think one of one thing that changed and remained the same and grew was, of course, women and work. And I think if you look at during the 20th century, huge changes took place in the work of women as they successfully fought for the right to work in a range of occupations for solicitors, for barristers, for politicians, for stockbrokers, company directors. At the start of the century, women were not in those occupations. By the end of the century, they were. We know that in 2017, Cressida Dick became the first woman commissioner of the Met. You've got in 2020, Dame Sharon White, whose parents were part of the Windrush generation, became the first woman to be appointed chair of the John Lewis Partnership. We've had three female prime ministers in England, as well, say no more, as well as women first ministers for Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, so for women like Cressida Dick, for Sharon White, for Margaret Thatcher, for Theresa May, for Liz Truss, Arlene Foster, Nicola Sturgeon, the activism of women in the 20th century made a significant difference. Yet, I think the story is complicated because for those in de-skilled, dead-end and poorly paid jobs, progress has been negligible. For instance, my book begins with a story about Olive Malvery, 
Olive Malvery was an Anglo-Indian journalist who wrote a, several books, one of which is called The Soul Market. And she talked about the lives of women in sweated labor. It, it's very emotional and it's very moving. And I think you can get The Soul Market on the internet and it's an easy read and it's worth a read. It's a great primary source. Now, Olive Mulvery's books sold incredibly well and it inspired campaigns to improve the lives of sweated uh, workers. And in the Liberal government, I think it was in 1911, I can't remember the exact date, actually brought in the first act to raise the pay or set rates, of, minimum rates of pay in four of these particular sweated trades. So you think throughout the 20th century, life is going to get better for working women. And indeed, for lots of women, it has. I mean, the Equal Pay Act, the Sex Discrimination Act. Yet in 2018, I remember with shock and horror reading the Financial Times, which is not exactly a socialist paper, and the Financial Times exposed the illegal pay and conditions in a number of Leicester textile factories. Now, these factories employed Asian women machinists who worked long hours for an illegal wage of £3.50 an hour. They had no holiday or sick pay. And during the COVID crisis, women were told to come to work even when they showed symptoms of the virus. So that's a hundred years difference. Yes, things have improved for lots of women. Some women haven't benefited from that. So when we think about change and continuity, they're both at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Both at the same time. Simultaneous. Yeah. I think um, before we went on air to do the recording, you used the idea of history as a roller coaster, the ups and downs for different groups and people traveling on different levels of roller coasters at different times, really. That seems borne out by what you've been saying. Absolutely, it is. And you can you can have a lot of instances of that. I mean, what what I said right up to the beginning, and not just about roller coaster, but in terms of one tends to think of activism throughout the 20th century as being a white experience. I've talked about Olive Mulvery, but of course, throughout the 20th century, you've got black female activists. And I think one of my one of my favourites in the 1970s, which is, of course, uh, Jayabin Desai. And Jayabin Desai worked at Grunwick in a film processing plant. And the owners, I can only say, really exploited her. Low pay, bad conditions, the usual stuff. This is in the 1970s. And again, it fits in with that roller coaster view of history. Now, Jayabin Desai worked with hundreds of other women, often often of Asian origin, often from the east coast of Africa, where they had, all, as we know, in the 1970s, the Asian population was forced to flee with the Africanization project. So they were quite vulnerable. But they thought, no, they are not going to put up with these conditions, and they went on strike. They went on strike for several months. What was surprising was the support that they got from white male trade unionists. I mean, I went on one of the Grunwick demonstrations outside the factory, and you see these heavy, burly, white miners, um, <laughs> engineers, train operators coming in to support the women. This had never happened before. In fact, a lot of the uh, trade union movement, white male trade union movement was often quite racist, shamefully. So this has marked a distinct change in labor relations between white men and Asian women. Uh, I think in terms of the roller coaster, we're on a high ride there. Unfortunately, unfortunately there is a down ride too. And the strike was unsuccessful um, and the women were, went back to work but it still made that very powerful statement of Asian women taking action with the support of white working class men. Fantastic to hear that they'd united and come together. So that's really within the last 50 years and hopefully we'll continue on 
in, into this century as well. Now, of course, a, a hot topic in the news of late has been the issue of abortion rights with the changes to the laws in America. Has abortion always been legal in Britain in the 20th century? The answer to that is no. And I can both say that as a historian and also from personal experience. Not that I've had an abortion, by the way, but just in terms of action that I took. In 1861, the Offences Against the Person Act decreed life imprisonment for anyone who had had an abortion or who had helped someone have one. In 1929, this was slightly amended and allowed abortion if the life of the mother was threatened. And in 1938, a legal precedent was set when a jury acquitted a doctor who had been prosecuted by the Attorney General for performing an abortion. So it still wasn't legal. And in 1968, after 31 years of campaigning, a limited form of abortion was allowed. Not everyone agreed with this. Two organisations, the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child and Life, were set up to oppose it. In their view, the fetus had the same rights as an infant or an adult. And Roman Catholics, who soon formed the majority of its members of both organisations, I think, believed life began at conception. Now, anti-abortion groups had the news of the world on their side. You might remember the news of the world. It's now out of circulation and it's now was owned by Rupert Murdoch. I don't know who owned it in, in the 1970s. But in February 1974, it published an article which falsely alleged that doctors sold aborted babies alive for experiments or sold fetuses to be made into soap. These were complete lies. And as we know, abortion rights are under threat in America and similar kinds of untruths are told. And again, you get this change in continuity. Now, in the 1970s, there were three attempts by the government to take away the 1968 abortion rights. And thousands and thousands of women, like myself, joined something called the National Abortion Campaign. And we took to the streets to make sure the government did not make abortion illegal again. And we won. But I remember going through every time a new bill was proposed, private members bill, to take away women's rights. It was scary. It was scary. Anyway, it's still here. And abortion is still, limited abortion is still available. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it sounds like it's, it's been a constant battle for women on all fronts, really, at all levels. You've mentioned the different class, gender, racial groups. So I think it's really important to remember that intersectionality. It's just not a straightforward story. You've got to think about the starting points of the group of women that you're speaking about and perhaps be quite specific in terms of teaching it. Yeah. Yeah, you do. I mean, and I think it was black women who who actually challenged white feminists like myself. What they argued in 1978, for instance, the Organization of Women of Asian and African Descent was founded and be quite a powerful organization. And along later with the South Hall Black Sisters. Um, and what they argued was that women suffered a, black women suffered a triple oppression as women, as black women, and because they were often uh, working class and poorer than the average person. Now, this, of course, challenged white radical feminists, especially who believed in the universality of womanhood. And they tended to believe that every oppression could be related to patriarchy, which, of course, it can't. And so from these activities, you get the birth of a new intellectual framework. And that, as you said, is the idea of intersectionality. And it's a new analysis for understanding the various ways in which women, and indeed men, experience prejudice. For example, a black woman may experience misogyny, but she will experience misogyny 
in a different way than that of a white woman. And so the work, I think, towards women's rights must be intersectional. Any feminism that focuses on white, middle-class, able-bodied women like me is absolutely a no-no at this point in time. And I'll give you an example, I mean, of, of the way that that, that challenges I remember Sally Alexander, who's now a professor of history, I may add, and a group of white women flow, throwing flour during a Miss World contest. It was in the 1970s. They were protesting at the way young women were paraded on stage in swimsuits just to see who was the most beautiful. That's what they were protesting about. What happened was a young woman from the Caribbean island of Granada won. Now, for the white protesters, the beauty contest degraded women. For the black women, it affirmed that black is beautiful. So you get these disagreements, if you like, and this idea of intersectionality. You know, Sally Alexander just hadn't thought of who was on stage and who won. They were just concerned about what they saw as sexism. They hadn't taken on board the issue of racism too and the issue of Eurocentric view of what is considered beauty. I think your book really does allow us to take the blinkers off based on everything that you've said. It gives us a 360 comprehensive view. It shows the part that women played at national global and local level. And I think I could do a roll call if we had time at the end of all the incredible women's stories that you tell, but I'll leave teachers and students um, to use the index at the back and call up those names. I think the scope for students and teachers to follow tracks of individual women, perhaps in their localities, like Lillian that you mentioned, who made a difference to their communities. It's, it's a fabulous book, Paula, and you should feel very proud of all of your ongoing achievements. And thank you so much for sharing all of those incredible stories with us today and being part of the Reteach podcast. Oh, thank you, Carmen. I've really enjoyed it. I was a little bit scared because it's the first podcast I've ever done, but you've made it so relaxing, such a lovely experience. Thank you. Thank you. No one would ever know it was the first. Long may you continue to activate and um, do your brilliant work. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.